Good afternoon and welcome. I'm John Robert Smith, former mayor of Meridian, Mississippi, and I'm pleased that so many of you have joined us today to talk about First in Maine and our Rebuild America's Communities Week. As you listen, please feel free to use the chat box which you will find in the lower left corner of your screen to ask any questions that you have, and we'll get to as many of those as we can later in today's webinar. For those of you who don't know, First in Maine is a coalition of local elected officials mayors, city council members, county board members, and tribal leaders formed to enact a blueprint of prosperity in America's local communities through engagement with members of Congress and the public. 134 local elected officials representing 37 states have come together to create and support the blueprint for prosperity. Our four simple principles for federal investment are Support locally driven community revitalization. Build vibrant, healthy, walkable towns and cities. Create opportunities for everyone in America's small and mid sized communities. Invest in infrastructure that creates lasting value. The blueprint contains 37 proposals within five focus areas that local elected officials told us are critical for providing their communities with the help they need to rebuild and remain competitive in today's economy. Over the last few months, coalition members have engaged with congressional leaders in Washington, D.C., at home, and through the media. In April, we held a successful fly-in, which brought two dozen First in Maine members to Washington from meetings with Capitol Hill and the administration. If you're a local elected official and you're not a member thus far, join First in Maine today via our website or by sending us an email. I want to remind you this effort costs you nothing but your time and your influence. And our work is paying off. The President's FY18 budget proposal sought to slash or eliminate many of the programs that you use and that we include in the blueprint. We were told by some, reduce your request to Congress, lower your expectations. But what we found was in the FY18 appropriations, Congress heard your voice and provided robust funding levels for the uh, projects contained in the policies within the blueprint. When the President signed the FY18 bill, he said that he would never again sign an appropriations bill at similar funding levels. Well, now Congress is finalizing the FY19 appropriations and so far has ignored that presidential threat. The FY19 appropriations bills moving through Congress continue the robust funding levels provided in the FY18. Let me give you an example. The Senate recently approved the FY19 Agricultural Appropriations Act and provided $3 billion for rural development program. Now that's an increase over the $2.33 billion in the first and main blueprint. I'll give you another. In the FY19 appropriations, both the House and the Senate provided $1.942 billion for Amtrak, which provides essential service to small and rural communities across the country. This is the second year in a row that this program has been funded above the first and main requested level of $1.5 billion. So our voice is not only being heard, it's being acted on by members of Congress. And as these bills are still moving through Congress, we need your help even more to ensure that these and other programs critical for your community's revitalization are funded in the final FY19 appropriations and the soon to follow FY20 appropriations level. That's why we want to have our, and have created our Rebuild America's Communities Week. We've told the story in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. Now we're bringing the story home. Rebuild America's Communities Week will be a series of events in local communities across the country to highlight the critical importance of federal programs and funding to complete projects and to help small and mid-sized communities prosper. 
Rebuild America's Communities Week will take place September the 15th through the 22nd as Congress and the administration prepare to approve final FY19 appropriations bills and before FY19 begins on October 1. First and main members were asking to organize events in their communities or schedule meetings with their members of Congress while they're home from Washington, D.C. on recess. The, two, the week proposed gives you two weekends when you can meet with your senators and a full week when you can meet with your House representation while they're both on recess. By organizing an event, you are helping to ensure that your priorities are reflected in the final FY19 appropriations. Together, we can demonstrate to Capitol Hill and the administration how important this federal funding is to your community. Your members of Congress will see firsthand how critical these programs are to your community's long-term prosperity. And you're going to hear more about Rebuild America's Communities Week later during our webinar. Now, today we have two mayors joining us, one from Michigan and one from Mississippi, both of whom have signed on to First in Maine and its policies. They will tell you first why this effort is critical to their communities, and secondly, what they plan to do during the Rebuild America's Communities Week. They will share their story of how a particular program in the blueprint helped their community. And we hope that you will be inspired by hearing their stories and that you will then lend your voice to this effort and tell your story to your members of Congress. More information is available on our website, which you should see there on the screen, um, and, or you can email us and you will see the address for that email as well. So our first presenter is one well-known to me, Mayor Eddie Fulton of Clinton, Mississippi. Clinton, Mississippi is located uh, very close to my hometown of Meridian, Mississippi. I know Eddie well, and Mayor Fulton has served four terms and will be up for re-election in 2020. He is a graduate of Mississippi College with degrees in accounting and economics with minors in English and Bible. He worked for Sears Roebuck for 30 years, moving 18 different times and wound up in the home office in Chicago. After his retirement from Sears, he purchased a sign business in Mishawaka, Indiana. Later, he sold that business uh, some three years afterwards and returned home to his native Mississippi. After traveling for a while with his wife, Judy, throughout the country, he settled down with Tennis becoming the center of his life, and he competed all over the South playing in several national senior tournaments. But in 2007, he found himself very discouraged with local government and the loss of um, opportunities for the town equipment, so he took it upon himself to run for mayor. And he won decidedly with a big whopping uh, plural of 20 votes. As mayor, he started and became a charter member of both the Lions Club and the Rotary Club. He serves on various boards throughout the state and is active in the legislative arena at the state level as well as the federal level. He finds that the challenge of a small municipality to be both stimulating and is one to which he can dedicate his work and his life to improving the quality of life for his citizens in Quitman. Mayor Fulton, good to have you on the call today. John Robert, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak on behalf of Quitman and the other 80% of the cities in Mississippi that are under 10,000 in population. And federal grants are important, and they're a lifeline for us in Mississippi. But not just the Community Development Block Grant, but there are grants available, which First in Maine is one of the recipients of. Those grants bring in the professional side to a small Mississippi towns that don't have the professional city managers or planning people or even zoning people. And so that's important for us. I can't stress the importance of that. When I talk about 80% of the Mississippi municipalities are under 10,000, I will tell you that mayors around this state are being told on a weekly basis, if you need more money, raise your millage. And 
when you raise millage in Mississippi in a small town, the millage will give you $5,000 to $25,000. It's pretty hard to pave a mile of road with that or get a bond for it. So <clears throat> the next slide will go to that. It just, it's just impossible without the help of the federal government and then the first and main people. We're a population of 2,323 people. We're the county seat. <clears throat> in order to get us started in the future, we did become the only fully fiber optic city in the state of Mississippi. We have one gig speed throughout the city, and that has helped us bring in some additional uh, mom and pop businesses into our uh, community. So that has been very beneficial. We're a city that don't have the industry, and <clears throat> we we have a um, dark container that makes the foam cut for all of the uh, fast food stores and, and oil field stuff. Where we've lost jobs is in multiple industries. We've lost over 2,000 textile workers in our county. We've lost uh, 1,500 people in the timber business when we lost our lumber mill. And then one of the things that Mississippi's done very well is they've developed a, a road structure around the state of four-lane roads. But in doing so, a lot of those roads bypass smaller cities, cutting down the, uh, the traffic flow. And it does hurt, and you have to make up for that somehow. The assets we have, I told you about the high Internet speed. That's great. We are really a recreational area. We have a historic downtown and an industrial heritage. In Mississippi, having one bank in your city is pretty good uh, in small cities. We have five banks, 16 churches, and a blue-collar workforce, and volunteers – primarily our, our women folk who really do the effort but to rebuild our city. Next slide. <clears throat> We've been benefited by federal grants for a variety of infrastructure costs. <clears throat> We've had a, a Brownville grant which led to a lot of things which I'll show you. But it's been a key to redevelopment of equipment. It allowed us to build a satellite community college on one contaminated site a senior citizen building on another site, and a barbecue restaurant in an old service station, and we were able to keep a, a health care facility open by removing the tanks. So that was a plus for us, and that happened in our county. Uh, next slide. If you're looking there, that's the lumber yard. That's 45 acres of land. And this is uh, a landscape architect drawing, bringing in recreational areas and uh, commercial on the front. The one thing, if you're in your city, if you're not growing, then you better start cutting expenses and figure out how you're going to be able to, to move forward. In our case, we've benefited so much from First in Maine and other sources that this brownfield allows us to draw this up. And this has been sent out uh, to about 150 developers around the country. And we are supposed to receive uh, any RFQ back on the 28th of this month. When that's done, we can break it out and talk to them individually to create this. It won't happen overnight. It'll take five years to do it, but it's, it'll be somewhere between 15 and 20 million uh, dollars. And uh, it gives us about 50,000 additional square feet of commercial businesses, residential construction, and a new library. Our library is small, and has, and right in the middle of it, it has a computer center. And people have to walk around, people working on the computers. It's just not uh, as easily accessible for all people, so it's not something we want to live with. Next slide. <clears throat> when I was talking about First in Maine and the importance of that, there are a lot of things that, as a local mayor, you really have to learn on the job or you have to have someone help you. Well, John Robert has been a friend of mine for years, and we received tactical assistance from them, funded by EPA, US EPA, Building Blocks, and USDA Rural Development. And when they came in, we set around tables that we had all of our people in town, that the movers and shakers, and we looked at everything that made sense physically and economically uh, and the redevelopment decisions. And from that plan, that plan that you saw on the rebuilding of the lumberyard, that took place. It made sense because it was next to the, your number one tax center. And that came as a result of our first and main uh, effort when John Robert brought his team in here to help us. Those kind of things, if they're not funded, those sites that you saw the redevelopment going on 
will never happen in, in, in our country. And so when I say it's critical to, to support First Amendment, when I say it's critical for us to make sure that our congressmen, they understand the needs for funding for not just infrastructure. We need infrastructure, unbelievably so. But we need also to have the professional input that we get and then the working session. We work for three days on this. And we've been on uh, every six weeks I have to send in a report telling what's going on. So, uh, John Robert and your crew, I am extremely grateful for that. And it was so beneficial to us. And Quitman, Mississippi, which looked like it was going to die, is now in the building mode. And we are having more people come into our city looking for places to locate. Our downtown was empty. It's now almost completely filled up. We have two buildings left. So good things are happening, but they don't happen when you're doing something on your own. You need a partner, and our federal partners at this point in time have been first in May. Next slide. One of the things we found out when we started doing the surveys, and this we got professional input on, we went to all of our people in town to ask what they needed. And one of the things that is kind of mind-boggling, you don't think about it, but we have a, a manufacturing facility, and they have keyboards at every station from a cost accounting standpoint and input stations. And one of the things our kids can do, they can text 25, 35 words a minute with their thumbs. But when you ask about typing skills, they can't do squat. And we have a turnover, so it's a problem. So this incubator is going to be a place where we'll teach people the things, the skills they need. And I, I'm sure you've heard of work keys and the... the uh, certificates that you get from that, and those are like eighth grade education was given in 1930. This is important. Now, the other thing is we are a, a fiber optic city, so we have to market globally. Well, our mom and pa's in town have now utilized that in internet for uh, Instagram, Facebook, websites, and we have one store that is housed a lousy location has no space at all, and yet they're shipping goods to Great Britain. Uh, they're shipping goods all over the world from their website. And it's truly remarkable what you can do if you can get connected on the worldwide global market and you can be successful in a town that's in the middle of, well, they say nowhere. I think it's a beautiful place, but that's important. So what's happened from this first night, we've got six new businesses, we have 18 teleworkers, and we have a bunch of um, mom pas that are using social media marketing that is developing their businesses. And so I'm very proud of that. This is something that I went to the governor's office, and they're going to give us uh, $150,000. We got $150,000 coming from um, a USDA, and then we're going to put up $100,000, which we've saved for five years, and we're going to build this building, and we'll have the training center and the incubator. And, uh, and part of that development that you saw in the um, lumber yard will be shops for our incubator. We have a bunch of people that have businesses that they'd like to start, and they need a low rent to start with their businesses. So that's all part of the network of bringing it together. And everything I'm telling you about, none of it was one individual idea. It came about from working with a group of people. We've had people in from several different organizations, but First in Maine was extremely helpful. And John Robert, I can't tell you how much that has meant to our city. And we are in a position now that I don't see anybody stopping us. I think we're going to move ahead in spite of all the impediments that, as a mayor, are thrown in front of you on a daily basis. Next slide. Well, what are we going to do for us? Because i got to pay... John Robert back for one thing, and I also have to make a, a point to our representatives. Uh, Roger Wicker, who is our senator, and new Senator Cindy Hyde-Smith, both have been invited to come on the 20th of September, and we'll have mayors from around East Central Mississippi come to this meeting. And Greg Harper, who is not going to run again, he'll be there also. All three of those will listen to the mayors, and we'll tell them of our needs, and we're going to extend um, an invitation to mayors outside of our area for them to come. We're going to feed them. And one of the things we're hoping to accomplish that, we want to ensure that our voice is heard in Washington 
and we get the funding that is necessary to help us maintain our cities and create a better environment for our citizens and quality of life. Those issues are important, and that's what is going on in Quitman, Mississippi. Next slide. And, and thank you, John Robert, for the opportunity. Thank you for uh, all that y'all have done for the city of Quitman. Well, Mayor Fulton, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for sharing uh, your stories there in, in Quitman, and, and thank you for the kind words about our efforts there. I really do appreciate that. I want to remind you that if you have questions, you can go to the um, chat box in the lower left corner of your screen and type in a question, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. We do have a question um, which I'll take right now at this moment. Are there population size limits on the EPA or USDA rural development grants? And the simple answer is yes. There's a more complicated answer, though. If you go to USDA, there's a breakdown of several different from 20,000 or less to 10,000 or less to 5,000 or less. Um, but what we will do is in the follow-up email, we will include um, some of the breakdowns for you in USDA rural development grants, uh, which break down basically over community facilities or housing. And we can send you that in the email. Uh, we did two years of work with USDA recommending some improvements to get better outcomes and better accessibility for smaller towns for their grant programs. And of course, those are wrapped up in the uh, policies for First in Maine. Uh, also, there are specific um, uh, sources within, within EPA, and we will send those to you as well. Uh, so you'll have that backup information. Um, and more to remind you, your, the time we're asking you to hold your event is September the 15th through the 22nd. The House is out that full week. While the Senate isn't in full recess, they will be home the weekend before uh, and the weekend after, so it gives you two shots with the senators and then certainly uh, the full week for the House. So, Mayor Andy Shore is the 52nd mayor of Lansing, Michigan, and he took office January the 1st, 2018. Uh, the mayor previously served in the Michigan House of Representatives, representing the 68th district. Mayor Shore tackles the legislative and economic issues affecting his region, uh, including dealing with blighted properties, talent attraction, and retention. Subjects familiar to all of us, regardless of the size communities that we serve. He has also served as Assistant Director of State Affairs for the Mich Michigan Municipal League. He served in that capacity for six years and worked specifically on the economic development issues across the state. Mayor Shore is a founding member of the Ingham County Land Bank and has served as a board member of the Tri-County Office of Aging and the South Lansing Community Development Association. Now, the mayor had a ribbon cutting to attend in Lansing, and all of you mayors and other elected officials on the call know that we don't always get to time those ourselves. We depend on others, and the mayor is uh, currently tied up at that ribbon cutting, working to break away, but in the interim, I'm going to ask Matt Ward if he will um, fill in for the mayor because he knows the mayor's subject as well. Matt? Uh, thank you, John Robert Smith, and hello, everybody. Uh, mayor Andy Shore does come highly recommended, so thank you for that uh, introduction, John Robert. Uh, my name is Matt Ward. I'm part of the First in Maine team um, and have been helping put together and support this campaign. Um, I am lucky to have worked with the city of Lansing, Michigan, uh, the state capital of Michigan, uh, a city of about uh, 120,000 people uh, since around 2005, and I've uh, been really pleased to work with Mayor Andy Shore um, since he was inaugurated into uh, the mayor's office at the beginning of uh, this year, 2018. Um, Lansing is absolutely using 
so many of the first and main um, uh, federal programs that we're calling for in the blueprint, they have turned around from very difficult economic circumstances uh, because of their partnership with the federal government and others to bring community revitalization and infrastructure upgrades and other improvements to their community. Uh, that is why Mayor Shore, as soon as he came into office as, as the new mayor, decided to join on the first and main campaign and tell um, his members of Congress and, uh, and share with his public that uh, the local federal partnership is critical to be able to continue moving forward in Lansing and places like it. So uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. I am going to uh, tell you a little bit about exactly what Rebuild America's Communities Week is about and how we are asking uh, the folks on the phone and folks all across the country in local communities to participate. So as John Robert had mentioned in the beginning of the webinar, we are um, uh, doing this uh, Rebuild America's Communities Week, September 15th to 22. I'm going to have some specific dates for you in a slide or two. Uh, the House is on full recess. The Senators are expected to be home for part of that time. Uh, it's a series of events that we want local government leaders and communities across America to participate in to say how important the federal programs and partnership is, particularly as the FY19 spending bills are getting done, and as the FY20 budget process gets ready to, to ramp up. Um, I will just note on that that because of the voices of folks like you um, working through First in Maine and, and other channels, FY18, which we're in, and FY19, which uh, the Congress is trying to put together, um, ended up being a strong federal domestic budget for the programs that matter to local governments. But it was, um, uh, it's very clear, uh, not only did the president say that he wouldn't sign another bill like that one, as John Robert mentioned, um, many of the bipartisan agreements to maintain funding at certain levels are, they're done in FY19. And there is quite a bit of discussion that FY20 uh, could blow up uh, in a bad way, uh, that we could go back to calls for eliminating the kinds of programs that really matter to local government revitalization. So we really are right at the time where we need to, to keep the message strong and let folks know about this and Rebuild America's Communities uh, Week is the time to do it. If you go to, go to the next slide, please, we'll tell you what that means. Okay, so the most important thing that I can say is that the, uh, the first and main team has put together a toolkit for this Rebuild America Communities Week. You can see there on your screen that it is at uh, www.firstinmain.org front slash toolkit. You can email our, our, uh, our First in Main uh, email if you want us to send you a direct copy of it. This is a robust toolkit that tells you exactly what Rebuild Week is about, what you can do to make it a successful week for um, this campaign and for advance your own community's interest in these revitalization projects. We have step-by-step -step suggestions, uh, uh, suggestions on the kinds of events you can have. We have talking points. We have um, uh, a real desire, as you'll see in the next slide or two, to be able to build up uh, messages to the public and in the media and in social media around the events and the work you're doing to advance this cause. So we have sample press releases and Twitter announcements and other um, templates that can assist you. Um, really all you need to participate in this Rebuild Week is right there. So um, if, you're, if you're going to be part of this, which we urge you to do, that's where you really need to go. And the other thing um, is that although speakers have talked about planks in the Blueprint for Prosperity document, and uh, many of you have been with us over this whole 2018 year. Um, it is very uh, useful and, um, and uh, will be helpful to you if you can look at the blueprint directly, if you want to know more about what we're calling to protect and, and, uh, and bolster in terms of federal uh, funding for key programs. 
You can see it right there. Um, and we very much want you to be familiar with at least the basic outlines of that blueprint before you, um, uh, before you hold your Rebuild America's Communities Week event. And, um, and we want you to print it out and hand it to your Congress member or your senator or the staff. Um, hand it to the reporters that are covering this. Um, uh, make it available on your website so that the public can see what your city or town believes in. Uh, this blueprint um, really uh, tell, tells the story of what you need to know um, uh, for this campaign. So uh, a toolkit and a blueprint, those are your go-to documents, and they're right there. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, so what's it really mean uh, for you to participate in this week? The highest priority what it's really about is get a meeting with your U.S. Senators uh, and Representative, as, uh, as many of those uh, three uh, people as you can. Some of you may have communities that have uh, more than one representative covering your town. So those three or four um, elected federal representatives, we'd like you to get a meeting with them. Um, and uh, there are some bullets down below that I'm going to discuss about the different kind of meetings that you can do. Um, there's a whole uh, variety of, of ways that you can make the point that federal partnership is making a difference in your community and to help your representatives really understand that. And then the, the, the second priority there is uh, get some buzz around it, get some press and social media attention for what you're doing. Again, the toolkit will help you figure out some good ways to do that. So some examples of ways that you could meet with your uh, representatives. Um, uh, you know, many of you have signed on to the blueprint, blueprint, but some of you have not. So um, if you sign on to the blueprint by going to the firstinmain.org website, you could announce that week that I believe in this blueprint. I think it will make a difference in my community, and I'm on board now. Issue press releases and put it out on your social media page and whatnot. Um, you can do a site visit or a walking tour. There's nothing more powerful than saying, uh, Senator, you know, this, uh, this road into this new uh, business incubator that's got new job training uh, on that old brownfield, it is making a difference. And the senator says, I know, I've been here for the groundbreakings and the ribbon cuttings. Well, Senator, I want to let you know that the job training was supported by federal programs. The road was supported by federal programs. The economic development of that incubator got a key federal grant, and we never would have got anywhere, uh, says people like Mayor Eddie Fulton, without getting the brownfield help to be able to figure out how to, to deal with the, uh, the contamination and other challenges on that site. We can't lose these resources now, sir or ma'am, and um, it's that kind of discussion that will really help your representatives um, you know, reconfirm that um, these federal programs are making a difference um, uh, for the places they represent and the places you live. So a site visit, it doesn't have to be something that's done already. It could be something that is um, planned or on the way or just got a grant, but you haven't built that, that economic development or that infrastructure or that downtown revitalization yet. So, so that's a really effective way of, of making your point. Um, you know, working with your Congress members, they may wish to allow, uh, you know, an announcement when you get on that walking tour. There may be photographers doing a walk-along, showing the Congress member touring with the mayor or the county commissioner uh, projects that made a difference, and, and uh, that's a very effective way to drive home these points. You could, uh, rather than doing a site tour, you could convene a, a stakeholders or a town hall meeting. You could get together key folks and have a program to discuss, you know, your key projects, how they've been helped by the federal resources, how the federal resources could help. Um, of course, um, uh, here is where uh, Mayor Andy Shore of Lansing is. He's at a ribbon-cutting ceremony. Um, I've heard it said that um, uh, local officials love nothing better than shovels and scissors, and uh, that, that means that uh, you're on the way to creating new, uh, revitalization or that you're celebrating an achievement and, and redevelopment and revitalization. And so if you have a project that's at that stage that has been helped by one of the blueprint programs, by all means, that's a great way 
to, uh, to drive the point home and get your representatives there, and uh, we would encourage that. Okay, if you don't have a big groundbreaking or ribbon cutting or a ability to do a site tour, for whatever reason, a meeting with your senators uh, or your representatives um, and their staff um, in their district office or in your office is, is, is good and fine as well. Um, you know, that face-to-face -face human interaction uh, with your federal elected representatives to help them understand why this is so important to you is really at the end of the day what we're looking for. Um, I will also um, suggest to you that as local elected officials, you, you will probably be able to get a meeting with the direct members, the Congress members and the senators, but sometimes that does not happen because of schedule conflicts or other things. If you can um, get their staff um, in lieu of them, we'd prefer the members, but certainly a district director or a district you know, a senator's economic development uh, lead for your state or region, um, uh, they uh, are very influential in working with their bosses uh, in the Congress as well. So uh, this, is, this is a key slide for uh, my kind of step-by-step -step explanation of Rebuild Week. Get a meeting with your representatives, um, uh, push it out to the public with good media, and there's a lot of different ways you can do it. Okay, next slide, please. All right, um, so uh, these may be obvious, and uh, I am confident that many of you local elected officials have done these kinds of meetings and events, but um, just to, to be very uh, practical about it, um, the first step is to, is to make an invite to your senators or members of Congress and their staffs. Uh, typically, it takes a good month um, to nail down a meeting with the members, and we're about a month away. So um, uh, we urge you to, uh, if you decide uh, to be part of this, which we hope you do, it's time to put out those initial um, invitations and a request for a meeting. Even if you haven't figured out the grand parade and ribbon cutting and all of those details, um, just try to reach out uh, and explore that week as a time that you can meet with them and then maybe you can uh, build up an event around that, that meeting. Or maybe you have the idea about what kind of event you want to do and you're ready to go. Um, uh, I am confident that most of you have made m meetings with your members of Congress. Um, uh, some uh, senators and members will schedule appointments back home in the district out of Washington. Some of them schedule them out of their district offices. Uh, you you, you probably have one or two of those offices near you. Um, so you probably know how to get those meetings. If you have any um, need of assistance, call that Capitol switchboard. You can see a number there, 202-224-3121. Um, and you can just say, I want to talk to Senator so-and-so's office. And um, what you should do is ask for the scheduler, say I'm calling on behalf of Mayor so-and-so or Town Supervisor so-and-so, um, or I am the Mayor or Town Supervisor, and I would like to set an appointment back home in, uh, in, in, in his state or her state. Um, do you schedule home district meetings out of, out of Washington, or do you schedule them out of the district? Who can I talk to? And then after you get that done, um, you're on the way. You can always email us. Um, we uh, can and will help folks out in securing meetings. So get that meeting. Then put together the kind of event or, or message you want to talk about. What's the project? What's the, what's the initiative? Um, how do you want to celebrate it and, or call need to it um, together with your members of Congress? Um, and then as you get closer to the week, um, send a media advisory telling the press it will be there. Uh, what, what's going on? Very important. Coordinate with the congressional office about whether and how you're going to have press there because you don't want to surprise a senator uh, with um, media crashing into a meeting that he or she might not have been aware of. So just coordinate with the people you're working with. Take good pictures and video. Um, give us copies of those pictures and videos uh, if, if we're able to use them um, and post them on your own websites and social media. Um, we want to make a lot of good noise about what's going on across America. And on that, the third bullet is that 
Um, it will be useful to the First and Main Coalition and, and our campaign if we know who has meetings, who they were with, um, uh, you know, any um, information about Congress member so-and-so loves this blueprint, particular planks three, five, and seven, um, that can help us be more effective in targeting our advocacy and information out to the offices that matter. If you get a letter to the editor or a good, or a good story in a newspaper, uh, send those to us because we'd like to collect and disseminate information about the good work you're doing back in your community. So that's uh, some uh, thought about how you could make your first and main week a success. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so um, we're going to provide a little structure to help this work well. Um, we are going to have a national kickoff conference call on September 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern time to say it is uh, Rebuild America's Communities Week, and we have folks all across the country doing stuff. We'll try to give you that last uh, uh, pep rally uh, and support talk to get going. Uh, uh, on the next day, on the 18th, uh, there will be an effort to get everybody setting out your tweets and other social media uh, on, on uh, getting the word out about what you're doing. Uh, there are some instructions in the, in the toolkit about that in our, uh, you know, Smart Growth America and uh, Sustainable Strategies, uh, which are the two of us who are helping run this campaign, um, have communications people who are going to be helping you uh, do that, uh, uh, that Twitter uh, outreach uh, on September 18th at 2 o'clock. And then uh, we hope that we have a bunch of uh, meetings and events and um, successful uh, communications that week. And so on September 26th, we'll have a wrap-up call that is kind of a, a debrief amongst ourselves about what did we accomplish, how did it go, and how do we keep the momentum rolling. So in between September 17th and September 26th is when you're looking for those meetings. Uh, we've already told you there are dates at the House should be on recess. Your House members may be back home, and there are, uh, there are weekends bookending that week where your senators are likely to be home. Uh, no guarantees at this part of September when they're trying to finish up the federal budget whether senators will get home early, but oftentimes they fly home on Thursday nights and they are available for Friday events, and then sometimes they're available for Monday events. So while they may not be on recess, um, Officially, the, um, working with your senator's office, you can find out when they might be in town and when you can plan your, your roundtable or, or a meeting. So uh, with all that, I'm going to move to the next slide, please. Okay. Uh, I can't speak for uh, Mayor uh, Andy Shore of Lansing uh, about the great things and the important needs in Lansing uh, the way he can, but I can tell you from – from working with him and working with his community, there are 38 programs, uh, federal programs, in the, the Blueprint for Prosperity for America's local communities, 38. Of those, six of them are proposals from, uh, from this coalition for, for new ideas, new programs that, that are really needed. So there are 32 that, that are existing programs are trying to protect or improve. And, uh, and six new ideas. Of those 38, Lansing has put 19 of them to work in ways that have been game-changing and catalytic and desperately needed in some cases in Lansing. Um, you can look at uh, tax-exempt municipal bonds and new market tax credits and historic preservation tax credits. You can look at the Economic Development Administration. And you can look at, um, you know, uh, the National Endowment for the Arts and EPA Office of Sustainable Communities. I'm going through the blueprint. I could tell you about 19 different programs that have made a difference and are continuing to make a difference in Lansing. And the only reason that they haven't used some of them is that they are designated, some of them, for rural communities or, or other communities uh, that would not apply uh, to Lansing. Um, and six of them are new ideas, but of those of those uh, programs they have not used, uh, I know that there is active work in Lansing to try to use the new Opportunity Zones program uh, to leverage resources for revitalization. There are plans to go for a 
what we used to call Tiger Grants, but are now called USDOT Build Grants. Um, uh, Lansing um, has been made uh, a, a great city with revitalization underway since a really terrible time in the uh, Great Recession and a real difficult time with the auto industry, um, very much struggling, uh, hundreds of jobs and companies closing. They have come back and are thriving in no small part because of these programs. So um, uh, that's why it's critical for Lansing to be involved and why Andy Shore signed on at the beginning. And during Rebuild Week, um, the mayor, who has worked closely with his congressional delegation, plans to meet with all three of the Congress members, two senators and Congress member, um, and hold a community roundtable um, to highlight how these 19 programs have made a difference in, in Lansing um, and to book in that with participating on the September 21 kickoff call and the September 26 wrap-up call and do a bunch of media and social media in between. So I hope Lansing's enthusiasm to do that is infectious and that all of you all will do it uh, the same way, and, uh, and that's what we're calling for in, in uh, Rebuild America's Community Week. And with that, I do believe I'm going to cue back to John Robert Smith. I believe that that is the end of my uh, slides, and thank you very much. Thank you, Matt, and thank you Will, for filling in for Mayor Shore and sharing the successes there in Lansing. I want to remind you now it's time for your questions, to use the chat box in the lower left corner of your screen to type those in, and we have two that I'll get to right now. The first is, how do I find more about your organization and the policies and politicians you support? To find more about our organization, go to www.firstinmain as one word dot org. So that's www.firstinmain dot org. Now, we um, when you when you go to that site, you're going to find our 37 specific or 38 specific policies, not politicians. We believe in the specific policies we are nonpartisan. So regardless of the party or the part of the country, we want your senator and your congressman to support these specific policies. So you'll find those policies they are very clear, but we do not um, endorse any individual elected official at the federal level or any particular poli uh, party. Uh, as you all know, being local servants, the potholes in your uh, communities do not identify themselves as Republican or Democrat, but they each have your picture in the bottom of that pothole. So it is an infrastructure issue um, uh, or an opportunity or an education or health care issue to be addressed. All right, the second question is, um, how does a complete pedestrian network of sidewalks fit into the vision of communities? Well, keep in mind that the National Complete Streets Coalition is a work of Transportation for America and is headed by Emiko Atherton, who is a colleague of mine and Scott's on this call. And But I want to answer that uh, more directly from the standpoint of, of a mayor and not a staffer. This is an economic development issue for me. Um, it is a strategy uh, to be implemented because we are all in a stiff competition over the creation of a sense of place as mayors and elected leaders in our hometowns or home counties. Whether you're a retiring boomer or an emerging millennial, uh, the statistics show that you're choosing a place based on its authenticity and your ability to get to the daily needs of life. That's to health care, to fresh foods and groceries, to entertainment, to education, back home again. And a walkable community is a competitive community. So a complete 
pedestrian network is a critical part of any community's successful economic development strategy. Um, you will also find the complete streets um, supporting policies contained within those policies that you see on First and Main. And if you uh, would like additional information on um, the Complete Streets, National Complete Streets Coalition, we will send those contact points out to you in a follow-up email after this call. I want to remind you that a recorded version of the presentation will be made available afterwards. And if you have um, specific questions, uh, please send them to uh, our to first name, whether those questions are for me or for Mayor Fulton or for Matt Ward. We want one place to address those. So send those questions to info at firstandmain.org. Always spell out the and. Info at firstandmain.org and we'll answer those questions we don't have time to today. Um, there is an about, a page titled about on our website. So if you access that, you'll find all the information about the work. There is a list of, of signers on that site too. Uh, there is a link for you to sign. We've made it very easy. This doesn't cost you anything. You pop the link and you sign on. Um, so it, it's very easy to become a part of this effort. We need your voice and we need um, your story. Uh, First in Maine is a project of Smart Growth America as is Transportation for America uh, that coordinates the transportation efforts specifically of this organization. Uh, are there other questions that you have? There do not appear to be any more questions in the queue, so I want to thank you again for joining today's webinar. You've heard from two different communities, one in Michigan, one in Mississippi, why First and Maine Blueprint is important to their communities and to their future. You've heard them describe why and specifically they are participating in the Rebuild America's Communities Week. Um, You've heard their stories. Hopefully they will uh, stimulate your imagination of the stories that um, you can also tell that um, may be similar to those you've heard from Quitman and Lansing. In addition to those two fine cities, we have confirmed that coalition members in the communities such as Belfast, Maine, Haleyville, Alabama, Frankfort, Kentucky, Knoxville, Tennessee, and Ranson, West Virginia will also be participating. We ask you to join together during this week to amplify our voices so that it spreads across the country in our states and to ensure that First and Main Blueprint is reflected not only in the final FY19 appropriations but beyond that uh, as we struggle to do so. We must be vigilant for the years to come. If you're not already a member of First and Main, please join the campaign go to www.firstandmain.org. And please use the toolkit available at www.firstandmain.org backslash toolkit um, to plan a successful event in your community. Uh, after 20 years in local government, I have a real appreciation for what all of you do, and I want to thank you for those efforts on behalf of your citizens. And if you have questions we haven't answered, feel free to contact us at info at firstandmain.org or visit our website, which I will not repeat again on this webinar. So thank you all. Uh, have a blessed day, uh, a great weekend ahead, and a super uh, September with a uh, very uh, vibrant Rebuild Our Communities Week in your hometown. Let us hear what you're doing. Uh, for First in Maine, John Robert Smith, thank you. <laughs>